Hi, my name is Peggy LaPointe, and this is Talking Trash, a Green Tips podcast, a chance for me to dive into the world of environmental issues by talking to people in business, government, and nonprofits, folks knee-deep in the field of sustainability. Episode 8 features Christopher Lofgren, founder and CEO of Bamboo Sushi. Christopher is also the CEO of the Portland-based Sustainable Restaurant Group. Well, I think that's a good, that's a good place to start because uh, you started your business in Portland. You do have restaurants in other cities. What does Portland mean to Bamboo Sushi? Um, man, so many things. I think Portland's instilled our culture. Um, so we've adopted the culture of the city in many regards. So that would be, you know, conscientious, thoughtful, um, progressive, uh, environmental, uh, socially, you know, minded, um, fair, trying to be very fair. Um, you know, our prices, um, we, people in Portland think we're expensive, but if you put us against any top sushi restaurant in any city, we're actually really inexpensive. Mm -hmm. The average ticket at a bamboo sushi in Portland is $35 per person. Um, that is a, you know, a little bit higher than a cheesecake factory. Like when you're talking about the quality of food that we're serving coming from, you know, direct from fishermen, from organic farms, uh, you know, we serve the highest quality of every single item that we have. Um, it's a small miracle what we've been able to pull off from a supply chain standpoint to be able to deliver that to people here. Mm -hmm. And um, people are appreciative. We're obviously very busy. Um, but it's something that I think that ethos too of like, be fair, we take that with us, right? So now when we're in San Francisco or when we're in uh, Seattle or when we went into Denver, we don't charge people more because they can afford more there. Right. We charge people whatever we have to charge to make the rent work, to make the salaries work for everybody so we pay our people well to make sure that we're paying our suppliers fairly and everything like that. But you know, we have what we need to make on the business side to make sure the business is successful, but we don't look at it and go, can we get more? Right. We look at it and say, how do we um, how do we treat this in the fairest way possible? And I think that's a, a, just a value of Portland that's very unique, right? It's like, yeah. it's more about creating good in the world than it is about uh, accumulating wealth. Right. Um, and I definitely think that is a Portland, <coughs> um, a, a wonderful feature of Portland. And the other nice thing about Portlanders, um, I know foodies gets tossed around, um, you know, and whatever that means, but uh, people s are willing to pay for good quality. Mm -hmm. uh, good food matters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, that is a wonderful aspect about living in Portland as someone who likes to eat good food. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of options. It's very European in its sensibility in the sense that like, and what I mean by that is that people here believe that good food is more like a right yeah, uh, rather than just a privilege. It's right. like good food. And that's one of our ethos too is good food, good, healthy, sustainable food that's good for the planet and good for people should be available to everyone. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't just be reserved for people who are wealthy. Right. Um, and so I love that about this city that people demand that. And so, I mean, you really can. When I have friends come into town from New York or San Francisco or L.A., they're blown away with the restaurants when I take them out and thinking – is that really the bill? Is there a zero that's missing? Is there something else? And it's like, yeah, no, this is what it is. And um, the one thing I would say we are different in than most restaurants here and most businesses here in Oregon in general is that we really do want to expand and take our business outside of here. Yeah. And the reason for that is we think that what we do here is so good it should be shared with everyone. Um, and so I wish more, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of, you know, to, to uh, the Ben Jacobson comment earlier, huge fan of Ben's work, um, Jacobson Salt. You know, they're all over the country now selling all over the world. A big fan of Kim Malik's work yeah. at Salt and Straw. Mm -hmm. She's a dear friend. You know, a big fan, obviously, of what Dwayne originally did with Stumptown and, you know, bringing that to kind of the coffee scene across America and sort of changing <clears throat> the dialogue one step further up from Starbucks. You know, Starbucks kind of came in and created better for you coffee. And then, right. you know, Stumptown was sort of like, now we're going to one up this. And then everybody yeah. started doing that. So there's a lot of other businesses, you know, Olympia Provisions mm -hmm. in Portland that have really expanded. Poc Poc did that. Um, I don't know if they still have businesses outside of Portland. I can't remember. Um, yeah. But I'm always proud and pleased when fellow Oregonians, fellow Portlanders do that because I think that, that what we do here is so special and translates really well to a lot of other areas, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, most people, if you say, hey, do you want, you know, a really great meal at a really fair price that's good for the planet and good for you? They'll be like, well, of course I do. And so that should 
just be something that's more ubiquitous across America, especially when we have a, a food epidemic crisis here of obesity, heart disease, cancer, you know, a broken supply chain. Um, so many things in this country with food systems is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so um, from that standpoint, I also want more good food operators to open more stores so that we can fix the supply chains and fix those problems by, you know, the supply and demand issue fixing itself because people buying better products. Right. And you can see that on your website. Uh, we were talking about this before we started the microphones. Um, Are they on now? They're on now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not just our little conversation. We're <laughs> sharing it. Um, Great. The website is fascinating be for a number of reasons. One, you lay out a lot of um, what you talked about as far as why you do what you do. But also, there's that aspect where you can see the carbon footprint mm -hmm. of the food that you serve. Yeah. And that gets updated regularly yep. because you are working with uh, various people around the world and you visit these fisheries mm -hmm. to, s to make sure that they're practicing in a way that you feel good about, yep. that you want to share. Um, so you have, like I said, you've got many aspects to that. And then you also, um, you know, you were talking about expanding um, not just your business, but creating that idea of, you know, good food at a fair price that's sustainably um, brought to the table um, because you started the Sustainable Restaurant Group mm -hmm. a, a number of years as well. So you're not just working on, you know, bringing it to Bamboo Sushi, but also um, to other restaurants as well. I want to talk about Bamboo Sushi, but now that we've talked about this sort of aspect, the Sustainable Restaurant Group uh, that you started 10 years ago, why? So the Sustainable Restaurant Group is the parent company of Bamboo and Quick Fish, which are two brands. One's a fast casual, one's a full service Bamboo. Uh, Bamboo is the more well-known one. Uh, Quick Fish is about two years old. Um, and Sustainable Restaurant Group uh, was started to essentially help scale our businesses, but also at a certain point, what we've talked about internally is we want to be the guiding force or guiding light for good in the restaurant industry. Yeah. Um, you know, there's kind of been this collection of, of restaurateurs over the last number of years who have done some pretty great work in different areas. You know, Danny Meyer, most notably for kind of social good, right? Mm -hmm. Taking care of his people and really creating a, a welcoming hospitality platform that everyone should be, you know, kind of the old Ritz Carlton model, like ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen, right? Um, and, you know, there have been some other great actors um, along the way with, you know, Alice Waters, Farm to Table, that kind of stuff. And we just thought, why not roll it all into one? But the thing that restaurants have been missing for a long time, and I think they've been either unaware of or maybe too afraid to do, is, is use science and data to really back up the claims. And so, you know, if you look at any other type of business, to make a claim, you generally have to have pretty hardcore science behind it, right? Mm -hmm. You can't say I have a five-star crash rating on my car if the National Highway Institute and Traffic Safety hasn't actually crashed <laughs> the car, right? And, um, you know, likewise, you can't say that you're going to get X, Y, Z on a bank note if it's not true. Like, there's a lot of facts that have to go into the rest of the world. And for restaurants, this idea of sustainability is quite nebulous. Um, for restaurants, this idea of social good is quite nebulous. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought, let's just say that these are the standards that we set. We're going to always set the highest benchmark. So the highest benchmark for how we treat our people, the highest benchmark for how we interact in the communities that we go into, the highest benchmark for how we treat the planet, and then the highest benchmark for the health, the quality of the food we actually bring in. Like, does it, is it going to cause cancer for people, right? Is, it, is our fish loaded with mercury? Like, we test for those things. Because we want to feel good about what we're serving people and know that what is behind the curtain is is better or equal to what it is that people's perception of the brand is, right? And that's where that trust builds too. And I think in an era where there is no privacy anymore and everything can be found out, we were a little ahead of the curve prior to the internet and Google and everything kind of taking off and social media where we just wanted to do the right thing because it was the right thing to do. And now that people can dig, we're hoping to set that standard so that when people do dig, they go, wow, this is a great company. Um, and if there are areas that they can poke at, we are welcoming it, right? Mm -hmm. We want them to poke to make us better. Yeah. And then um, we hope to hold ourselves up as a, as a benchmark for others to say, if we can do it and we can be profitable, you should try it too. Yeah. Don't be afraid, right? And it's, it's, it's not because we think we're better than anyone. It's not because we're uh, preachy. It's because we want to see an industry. I mean, most people don't know the stats, but the restaurant industry is the largest employer in America. Mm -hmm. 16 million people work in the restaurant industry. And that's just in the restaurants specifically. That's not counting trucking, transportation, agriculture, um, you know, all of the different people who manufacture tables and chairs and plates and, you know, right. 
everything else. It's a massive, it's a multi-trillion dollar industry when you really look at everything. And it's not really an industry that people take no, like take care of or take note of, right? It's like people want the best, safest working conditions for people working in the automotive industry. People want the best for teachers and teachers unions and people want the best for healthcare workers and no one talks about this, right? And yet you have a country that is worried about uh, the you know wage gap. You have a country that's terrified of unemployment, uh, you know, going back up. Uh, you have a country that is worried about immigration, immigration reform, healthcare. All these things are deeply impacted by the restaurant industry and with the restaurant industry. And so I feel like if the restaurant industry can fix itself, mm-hmm. start paying people better, give people career advancement, opportunities, treat people well, teach them how to be positive citizens in society, right? I mean, a lot of the people who come into the restaurant industry, maybe it's their first job, uh, maybe they don't speak the language, whatever. If you're giving them this very harsh condition, you're going to create a very harsh person, right? But if you're giving them the tools to teach and to grow them as a great citizen, they may stay in the restaurant industry, they may move on to something else, but they'll become a better part of the fabric of our entire society. And so... It's this very simple and yet deeply, I think, noble, important profession that is left, meaning hospitality, like mm-hmm. service, right? Like we don't have a lot of things that are that focused anymore. We try to automate everything, right? Because right. it's like people are difficult. And yeah, they are. But I also think that people are beautiful and amazing and wonderful and creative and interesting. And um, we find it to be a part of our mission to give people an opportunity to be their best self. Mm-hmm. And if we can do that in every community we go into and we can make hundreds of restaurants then we can affect tens of thousands of people's lives, imagine the lives and that they'll touch and they'll affect and that'll grow. And so that's a really big part of our mission. And so um, we use B Corp as an assessment for that mm-hmm. uh, benefit corporation for anybody who doesn't know what that is. Um, it's a rating system. You can go online. You can see our assessment. You can see how well we did. You can see how well we did against other restaurants, other businesses. Um and then, you know, we use the Green Restaurant Association for our certifications for all of our equipment and energy use and everything else. We're at Marine Stewardship Council certified for our wild capture fish. We're Aquaculture Stewardship Council certified for our farm raised fish. Um, you know, we look at all these different aspects and then to the carbon point you were making earlier, you know, we wanted to, again, set the benchmark as a restaurant company. And so using Sustainable Restaurant Group to do so, we went out and decided to analyze our entire carbon footprint. Because we think that's kind of the next frontier beyond like, okay, now you take care of your people. Great. Now you're taking care of the planet. Great. Uh, With the food you serve. That's like what most restaurants think. And then, okay, you build your restaurant sustainably, right? You use reclaimed wood. You use low energy products. You know, these things, et cetera, recycled paper, all that. How can you do more? And it's Mm -hmm. like, well, what's the carbon footprint of the thing, right? Like how, what's our trucking and transportation and logistics and everything else and how much... You know, how difficult is it for are people all driving or are they Ubering? Can we encourage ride share? Can we, you know, there's all these different ways. And so it's like we as a business want to combat every single front we can to be the best business we can be, um, focusing in the two key arenas that we really care about, which is, you know, the planet and people. Yeah. And carbon neutrality, getting there is is challenging because uh, as a restaurant, uh, you run a restaurant, you've got employees coming at all different hours. You've got just... Uh, Things that are built in, uh, like you said, the transportation of the food um, and all these things that you can't change. I mean, as when Kink went carbon neutral, there are things we can't change. We can't change the fact that we have to be powered up 24 hours a day. And we have folks coming in at all hours of the day and night where, you know, transit's not running at five o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, you know, and, and those sort of things. And you offset your carbon uh, footprint through uh, seagrass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, seagrass sequesters eight yeah, times more carbon than uh, trees do. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so you're putting your uh, resources into an area that again makes your your company bamboo sushi. You know, you're giving back to that fertile area, which is the water where the fish their habitat. Um, you mentioned uh, a number of things, uh, and you listed all four of them that I wrote down that I thought were um, interesting because you have some design and operational decisions based on these principles, on on the sourcing, on the footprint, on the community and the partners. And the community, you you touched upon this, it's not just your community in the restaurant, your workers in the restaurant, but it's a community at all of these fisheries in all of these countries where you're getting your, your, um, your fish and your seafood. And that's not common. It is more so in Portland, I guess, with the folks that I've that I've talked to, whether they're serving beef and and they're going to the farms, or uh, Karen with Nosa Familiar, where she's she has been uh, at some of the coffee growers 
and, and seeing what they're doing. But generally speaking, this is not something that's happening a lot. You had that intention when you started your company. And what I found interesting, and but then again, as I'm listening to you speak and hearing what you're saying, your background is tech. And it didn't dawn on me until we're sitting here now that a lot of what you're saying, I hear the tech part of you, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's your website uh, and the numbers uh, and your tech head is still there, mm-hmm. but you're in the restaurant business. Mm-hmm. So how do you go from somebody who starts off in tech to now owning and operating uh, Bamboo Sushi? Um, well, I think there's a couple of things. So I get to use both sides of my brain between the two businesses. So um, I like science and math and data, and I like things that are absolute. Yeah. Um, I also love coloring outside of the lines, mm-hmm. and I love humanity and all of the messiness that comes with it, and the restaurant industry is probably the most shining example of that. Um, As anyone who's worked in the restaurant business Yes, knows. anyone who's worked in the restaurant and business And I knows. recommend everyone work in the restaurant business. Me too. I actually think it should be part of like a requirement yeah. uh, when people get out of school, it's, yep. or at least when they're in school. It's great. It just it creates a lot of humility. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as, as that, I think that there's, in general, there's kind of a prescription right way and wrong way to do things uh, in a team dynamic, I guess you could say. And, mm-hmm. and a company is just a team. It's just a big team. Uh, you know, the Patriots uh, this past Sunday won their sixth Super Bowl, right, in the last 18 years. And they've been nine times and 13 AFC championships or something crazy. And they have this saying of the Patriot way. I'm not a Patriots fan, but I'm just impressed by that right. level of discipline. And... Um, I think that in any organization that strives for greatness, um, they have to look at how that team dynamic works, right? And so for me, tech companies tend to have pretty good team dynamics in the corporate world, right? I mean, Google kind of set the standard for what people want to do when they go to work for a company. Um, You know, Apple's always been one of the most inspiring places in the world to work. Now Tesla is one of the most inspiring places. Facebook for a long time was a place that people really loved. They've got a little bit of a PR issue to work through (laughs) and a culture issue, but Nonetheless, tech's done a really good job of, you know, understanding how to create its products, get them out to the world, take care of their people, organize, move quickly, um, you know, and in the process, they make gobs of money doing what they do. And for the most part, people pretty much like those companies, right? Mm-hmm. Like they don't they're sit there. Well. And, yeah, they don't look at them like, oh, you're a terrible insurance or bank company stealing from people or whatever, right? You're providing a product and people like it. Mm-hmm. And in the restaurant industry, it's really weird because um, so many restaurants are run the exact opposite of a good team, right? It's an owner who might be skimming money off the top or employees who are stealing and aren't being held accountable and therefore creating a toxic culture or hostile work environment. You know, obviously a lot of people know about all of the, you know, prior incidents uh, that kind of became famous in the restaurant industry, I think back in the eighties and nineties for, you know, kind of, um, um, sexually inappropriate advances by managers towards like female staff and things like that. And it's just, that stuff has no place in any company, right? Mm -hmm. Any culture at all. And right. it's accepted in the restaurant industry, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, because the restaurant industry itself has never held itself up saying we deserve better. Right. We deserve more. And so it was kind of like, well, we're this throwaway industry that nobody's really looking at, even though we're massive. I mean, just an ins- and touch every life, touch every life daily, massive multiple industry times a day. But, you know, that would never fly at, you know, there's no startup happening in San Francisco that's getting funded, that's doing that right. Or wherever you want to say, I right. mean, that's just an easy example. So the point being is that there's a right way and a wrong way to create a good team. And I wanted to create the right way. And so I just applied that to the restaurant industry. And, mm-hmm. you know, for the most part, it's, there's a kind of a playbook. You can apply it to sports. You can apply it to business. You can apply it to restaurants. You can apply it to your home life. Right. There's a right way and a wrong way for my wife and I to talk about things and deal with stuff. You know, I don't come home, some emotional, chaotic person throwing my hands in the air screaming. I say, Hey honey, I have to talk to you about something. And can we sit down and have a conversation? And, yeah. you know, I'm feeling this way. I'd like to share my feelings with you. And, you know, an emotionally mature, advanced uh, relationship of communication and honesty and trust and all of those things. So that's how we try to run the business. And um, it, it generally works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it doesn't always, but it, it generally does. And um, I would say that, you know, for the most part, uh, the restaurant industry is giving me an opportunity to, as you put it earlier, touch so many people's lives. Mm-hmm. That's what I really love about it versus tech, because I feel like tech can touch a lot of people's lives, but in a very kind of impersonal way. Even Apple, which probably makes one of the most personal products in the world, your iPhone probably knows more about you than any person on the planet. <laughs> um, for good or bad. For good or bad. But Apple, you know, I, I believe that they really care about your privacy, and I don't think that they really know that much necessarily. I mean, they know a lot about you, but not everything that your phone does, right? Google knows a lot about you. That's probably where <laughs> your, all your stuff is, right? But the point around that being is that, like, 
I get to meet my customers, right? Yeah. I shake their hands. I, I meet their kids. Um, I, I read their letters. It's like a very different thing because at the end of the day, like you eat my product. Right. You put it in your body. You come into my home, so yeah. to speak. And that's really unique. And I take that very seriously. And I know our team does too, um, where, you know, it's not, it's not, you're not just holding it in your hand. You're not just talking to it or touching it or writing in it. You're consuming it. Yeah. It's becoming one with your body. Right. And so because of that, and because you get to eat the product that we manufacture on site in real time, as opposed to like then like, you know, making, let's say a candy bar or something. And then mm-hmm. I don't, you eat the product, but I never meet you. It's like this convergence and actually restaurants are the only business in the world where raw product comes in, raw product is assembled and manufactured and then sold and consumed all within the same four walls. Right. There's no other business in the world like that. And so it's just a very interesting feedback loop um, that requires a different level of sensitivity and thoughtfulness behind it. And that's something that we really love. So I think looking at all those different things, you're 100% right that my brain does think about problems and solve them in a very tech way. Um, but I also try to apply just great team business practices to anything that I'm in, yeah. irrespective of whatever the industry is. Because there is a right way to treat people and a wrong way to treat people. There's a right way to motivate and a wrong way to motivate. There's a right way to, I think, break down problems into their base parts and then work up from them. Um, and so that's what we try to do in everything that we're looking at. Yeah. So I've read uh, when you decided to open up a restaurant, you investigated um, the best way to source your food. Um, was that... So so you went into this uh, company, you went into creating bamboo sushi um, with the idea of, and you can tell just be looking at your website, with the idea of this is going to be the most sustainable product I can bring to a table. Yep. Um, what was that process like? Because that's a lot of legwork. That's, that's a huge commitment. It took a um, number of years to get that supply chain built. Right. And so what were the growing pains with that? And what did you learn from it? Because you're moving forward and you're growing. Yeah. Uh, we learned a lot. And it was a lot of growing pains at the beginning, especially considering we started during the beginning of the recession. So the restaurant opened in November of 2008. And right. if everybody remembers, or yeah. maybe would like to forget, <laughs> the entire U.S. economy collapsed in September of that year. Yeah. And so it was the beginning of sort of a really long drought and trough of, of difficulty the positive around that was we had a lot of people who prior to us, prior to that, prior to the recession happening, wouldn't take our phone calls. So when we'd say, hey, we want to buy this product from you, um, they'd say, well, um, you know, we don't need you as a client and we will only sell you. And this is a very common practice, actually, especially in fishing, where they'll have all this unsustainable stuff or old quality stuff that they need to, quote unquote, move. And they'll force the smaller purveyor into buying that so that then if they want to get the good stuff, right? It's like this kind of weird thing where they're like, we got to get this off our plate. Otherwise, why should we sell to you? You're just a, a nuisance. And so we had this very weird you know, time where we were like, okay, nobody wants to work with us. And then the recession happened and we hadn't opened the restaurant yet. And we were all of a sudden, like all these phone calls started changing. It was like, well, you know, we could do this and do this. And so, you know, we didn't have, our menu is significantly bigger now. We have more options. We are continuing to grow those options as more science and data comes in of what is sustainable. Um, but also because now we get people wanting to work with us constantly mm-hmm. because of our size and scale and also the commitment that we have. Right. And so anybody else who really has that same level of commitment wants to have their stuff showcased with us. And it's a vice versa relationship. Um, so, you know, it's just been it's been a fascinating journey. I mean, the, so the supply chain is, is the key to what we do. Um, it's the it's the thing that allows us to deliver the best, highest quality products um, from a sustainability as well as a human health standpoint from anywhere we can source in the world. We're very fortunate that in the United States, we actually have really well-managed fisheries here. And so about 80% of the products served in bamboo come from U.S. waters, right. um, which is great. Also helps cut down on the carbon footprint right. and also keeps the costs lower on freight and shipping and also reduces the amount of air freight miles because we can ship things by boat or rail, which are the most sustainable forms of transportation mm-hmm. in the world. So there's a lot of things that we did to change that. A lot of restaurants, especially in the sushi world, brag about flying things in from Japan, um, which which always makes me chuckle um, that that still works as a as a marketing ploy because the skiji market in Japan, which is now not the skiji market anymore because it closed, it's turned into a new market. But prior to that, 60% of all the seafood in the world flows through Japan every day. It's a massive number. Um, but if you actually look at what's in the Sea of Japan and what's in kind of the China Sea and everything like that, that they would be sourcing quote unquote locally from, um, it's mostly things that US people don't eat. Right. Um, it's it's a lot of, you know, silverfish and herring and mackerel and weird, you know, um, 
you know, kind of species of, 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 of different uh, like sea snails and slugs and, you know, clams and stuff that, and they're delicious or wonderful. It's just not an American thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so the funny thing is that always cracks me up about these restaurants when they say, well, we flew all this stuff in from Japan is I'm like, so you're bragging about the albacore as a small example. One of my favorites is when people brag about the albacore that got flown in from Japan. And I was like, the albacore swim off the coast of Oregon and Washington. That's Oregon albacore that then was bought by a Japanese distribution fishing company from an Oregon fisherman, sent to Japan, relabeled, 3 x in price, 3 x in carbon, and then shipped back to you. And you're bragging about that, even though I am going directly to that fisherman, talking to him, shaking his hand, pulling that albacore, and just having it <laughs> driven from the shore to our restaurants here right. in two and a half hours. Right. So it's just, it's one of those things that just cracks me up all the time. But, you know, to each their own, and, you know, I understand why restaurants still use that as a marketing point. A lot of people who are even working in restaurants don't understand the, the supply chain aspect. That's really the problem is they don't spend the time. Chefs are so busy, and I get it. It's such a hard job. Mm -hmm. And they're so busy just, you know, making payroll and coming up with dishes and delighting their guests and cleaning the kitchens and making sure the equipment's not breaking and yada, 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 that they don't have time to then be like, I need to spend six months researching the supply chain and going all the way back up. Now, a lot of chefs are starting to do that and they're starting to meet the farmers and everything like that, but seafood's really complicated. Mm -hmm. It's why nobody had really tried to solve that problem earlier and why there were so many restaurants focused on sustainability, but they could only get to the terrestrial side of things. Even Chez Panisse, I mean, obviously is considered to be one of the most sustainable, you know, farm to table restaurants in the history of the world. And they were serving red listed seafood until maybe like a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know, right? right. And, you know, they were believing their their distributor who said it was this way, and so and the distributor doesn't have necessarily your best interest at heart. They're a salesman, right. um, and there's nothing against distributors. We just work with them very differently. We go out and we buy the fish ourselves, and we broker those deals directly with the fishermen, and then we use a distributor like a PO box. Mm -hmm. So we'll then go to the distributor and say, "Hey, you have logistics, freight, and um, cold storage. Right. So we'll pay you." an X percentage markup on this fish that we negotiated the price on, we're going to bring in this much product. Is it worth it to you? And generally now at this size, they're like, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. We'll use all of our, because we're going to truck things around anyway. We'll just truck them around for you. But that's really the best use of a distributor in that sense. It's not to trust them that they're somehow reading up on the science and literature. And that, that's not what they do for a living. Mm -hmm. What they do for a living is buy product and sell it for more. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> I have one more question for you um, for a number of reasons. One, because you brought up her name, Kim Malik. Uh, who I had a chance to interview last year for the Portland 50 uh, podcast series. And we spoke at the time about her expansion and how thoughtful it was and w all the legwork that she does to make sure that uh, anytime she opens up a new uh, place, she goes down there. There's training involved, intensive training. so that a And she brings people up to Portland as well um, so that the culture mm -hmm. is spread and shared by each and every one of her employees. So it's a really thoughtful way to grow. Um, you're going to be expanding. You want to be expanding. Um, have you thought that out, what that looks like, and how to make sure that the culture that you've cultivated here um, is the same culture that will be in a restaurant that you have in Chicago or St. Louis or yeah. wherever? Yeah, I mean, it's a similar approach to what Kim's doing. Um, you know, uh, it, it's it's a kind of a tried and true, you know, formula. You you've you've got your culture. That's the most important thing you have for your company. Um, also, most important thing for people who uh, want to believe in the brand and have like a level of consistent trust. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, how you seed that is really important. So, as an example, like our general manager right now of our Denver location was the assistant manager here in Portland, who then worked up to a general manager here, and then we gave her the opportunity she wanted to move from Portland to Denver. Um, and so she moved and, you know, that's really exciting for us there to have the team there, have somebody from here who, you know, has that culture. Likewise, um, you know, we also want to make sure that we're sensitive to the fact that every city has a different culture. Right. And so we try to do a really good job too of understanding that there's non-negotiables and then there's cultural integration in certain places. So the non-negotiables are, you know, we don't cut corners on our quality. We don't cut corners on sustainability. We don't cut corners on the way we treat our guests. We don't cut corners on the way we treat each other. Those things have to be a part of our culture, no matter if we're in, you know, Abu Dhabi or Portland or LA or, you know, Rio, like mm -hmm. we would want those things to be a part of the business culture. At the same time, how the staff 
you know, uh, interacts with guests, uh, maybe the service steps of the way treating people, you know, is different in a different culture even or a different city. Um, the, the, the pricing of the food, meaning like in Portland, people are really uh, wanting a more uh, kind of uh, cost, cost effective meal, as we were mentioning earlier. And, you know, we will probably have more unique specials in San Francisco because people want that. They're right. actually demanding, hey, I want it. You know, we even see it in Portland, right? Whereas Lake Oswego, it's a wealthier enclave of the city. And they have been asking, like, hey, can we get this? Can we get this? And it's, it's cool, right, to see different ones. And then other uh, locations may say, hey, we want more of these things, right? And so you're kind of culturally integrating into each neighborhood, each place, trying to become a part of that fabric rather right. than just like a cookie cutter um, box formula. So yeah, we, 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 it's a delicate balance. And it's, I mean, as I'm sure Kim said to you, it's probably the hardest thing to do in business, you know, yeah. is that aspect of it. Um, and I think in this day and age too, where consumers less and less want cookie cutter, yeah. um, they don't want the big box chain anymore. They want unique, um, giving them that, but then making dozens or hundreds of locations is very complicated, but mm-hmm. you know, it's what, is the business challenge of today and um, we'll solve it and then there'll be a new one for my son's generation. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy I won't have to deal with that one. So right. you know, there's always something new. Well, thank you, Christopher, for stopping in. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining me for my conversation with Christopher Lofgren, founder and CEO of Bamboo Sushi. If you've missed any of the previous podcasts, you can find them at our website at kink.fm. Be sure to like and subscribe to Talking Trash, a Green Tips podcast on Apple iTunes or wherever you're listening. Talking Trash is a podcast series featuring people in business, government, and nonprofits, and sometimes just regular folks in the Portland area and around Oregon who are having an impact in the world of sustainability. 